Well, the collapse of public trust has exposed our idolatry. We've trusted everybody but God. So for the people listening that see all those things happening, this isn't a disaster to me. This is God moving in the earth, preparing a church, preparing his people, awakening us. If America is going to have an extended future of freedom and liberty, it will be because the people of faith decide that faith is more important than the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or our favorite benefit that comes to us from the government. It's interesting because par part of what we see in the church is this kind of drifting where, where, where we drift, you know, into this kind of a heresy and then we drift back into the opposite heresy. It, so when you talk about law, law and order, you could, you could hear a lot of Christians saying, well, wait a minute, what about grace and love? As though we're advocating for, for law and order against grace and love. Clearly we're not, but there are a lot of people who seem to kind of sloppily slide into grace and love and forget that if you're not grounded uh, in law and order, you're going to have less grace and love. Yeah, we, there's a lot of confusion in the church. You know, it's, it's been a sloppy grace. We've had this gospel of salvation, which I believe in conversion, being born again, the new birth, that divine supernatural entrance into the kingdom of God. But we've stopped our story at that point, and we've told far too many people that if you take that step of faith, if you recite a little prayer, then you can live your life any way you want to, and you can roll back in with kind of a chirpy little, oh, I'm sorry, and everything's good. And there's no obligation to honor the Lord with your life. And we've said that for so long that before lawlessness ever made its way into the culture, we lost any sense of God's boundaries in the church. We have, the reason we have no moral authority to talk about transgenderism is we've winked and nodded at fornication. We've winked and nodded at adultery. We said, oh, it's not that big a deal. You know, we can live together. We can do whatever we want to do. We've moved marriage for the most part out of the church. You get married in a barn, on a beach. You have a party with your friends. You know, the church was a little bit inhibiting. The sense that it's a covenant between a man and a woman in the sight of God. The church hasn't been willing to hold that idea up because it would cause us to be ostracized a little bit. If the church will come back and be who we're supposed to be, we'll see it reflected in the culture again. That's what Christians waiting for the next politician or political party to fix us is idolatry. We have an assignment to be the conscience of the culture. If we'll have the courage to do that at our kitchen table, at our holiday table, and with our friends, we'll see a change in the culture. Well, again, it is interesting. It takes some uh, courage. And, and yet, what I say everywhere I go is that if we actually believe that Jesus defeated death on the cross, then we are utterly free to say, to speak the truth. We're not supposed to uh, say, well, uh, this will happen to me or that will happen to me. We're supposed to have this joyous freedom that he has given us by dying and defeating death on the cross, rising from the dead. And <clears throat> in a way, if you have a full-throated faith in that Jesus, you're free. And if you don't, you're not free. You're afraid, you're governed by fear, you're looking around wondering where the consequences are. And we have, I guess, because we've been so blessed as a nation and as a culture, we've really gotten soft and unwilling to pay uh, the prices that previous generations have had to pay. Um, and, and so that's why we've, we've just kind of drifted uh, to, to where we are. But as we've been saying in the conversation, people, some people are waking up, some people, but what I get excited about is that there's a lot of non-believers waking up and voicing common sense truths, and in a sense, and God always does this, shaming Christians into, you know, uh, who, who do I have to listen to to hear common sense, a comedian or whatever? I should be hearing it from my fellow Christians, I should be hearing it from the pulpit, um, so there's just something interesting happening in the culture that things are so bad that a lot of people who uh, are, are just noticing that these things are preposterous are daring to talk about them and we're, when a lot of Christians are kind of hanging back. Yeah, the theater of the absurd has become so bizarre. And we're, some of us are actually growing weary with being given bread and being sent to the circus that we're starting to grapple with what's happening. You see, I don't think that we're motivated just by freedom. We should be motivated by the obligation of love. We have an obligation to tell the truth. That's an expression of love. If you go to the oncologist and he doesn't tell you you're sick, he's not your friend operating in love. He's a quack and it's malpractice. 
and the church has been a little guilty. But as you said, we're waking up in record numbers. COVID's a gift. If we could thank God for the pandemic, it's like the curtain's been pulled back, and there's all these people now stepping into the light, and we're blinking. It's a little uncomfortable. Yeah. But God is mobilizing us. There's something good ahead of us. Well, that's what I, I feel like every time you know the enemy overreaches, uh, it, it's an opportunity for us to say, oh, I, didn't, I hadn't seen that. I hadn't noticed that. But it's become so, become so silly. Uh, you know, I, I, I remember when uh, Bruce Jenner was on the cover of Vanity Fair, you know, in his guise as Caitlyn. I remember thinking, this is so crazy. I don't even know where to turn. And that was just the beginning of this crazy stuff. And people in America, I guess, the, I mean, you, you know this as well as I do, but like if we have a kind of a national sin, it's we want to be liked, we're nice. You know, the Germans followed orders. We all have things that can be good, but that can turn bad. And when you are kind of tolerating something that's like an in-your-face crazy, uh, you know, sometimes that's politeness. And other times, it's just fear of man. Yeah, well, you used the pendulum discussion earlier, and I think we're guilty of that in America, and it's especially in the church. You know, the pendulum always swings back this way. Things balance out. Now, th that, that idea really expresses a profound ignorance of history. The British lost the empire. Rome did collapse. The, the Jews were driven out of Jerusalem, and the temple was burned. The pendulum does not always come back to center. It requires choices on our part and some intentional decisions. Or I'm with groups of Christians frequently, and they say, well, you know, the, the church is the sleeping giant. I pray that's true, but I have enough experience in the church. I don't know that there's a giant sleeping. I think there might be something small sleeping, and I pray it wakes up. But I think we're going to have to seek the Lord as if our lives depended upon it. Right. We're going to have to get far more intentional. You and me, I'm not pointing my finger at anybody else. I've got to know the Lord in a better way next week than I know him this week. In greater power, I have to recognize the voice of his spirit. We have followed the conventional wisdom of the secular culture for so long, we don't recognize the truth any longer. It's uncomfortable to us. I'm not asking somebody else to be the difference. I'm saying I'll change my schedule, my life. I'll be vulnerable. Let's go tell the truth. Well, it again, it's fascinating. We're living through something that, you know, a few years ago, we couldn't have imagined. Mm -mm. When you talk about COVID pulling the curtain back, uh, I, I have to say that it, it really, it's a process for people. It was a process for me. At first, I kind of thought, well, okay, whatever. They're going to get a vaccine. Everything will be fine. And then more and more and more, you, I was horrified uh, when my wife would say, you, you know, they're sending... Uh, they're sending uh, people into the nursing homes and, you know, kind of implying that they know this is going to increase the death rate. And I remember thinking, they, they wouldn't do that. I mean, they, they, they wouldn't do something like that. Um, a lot of people feel that way about the, the voter fraud, about election fraud. They wouldn't do that. And you think, well, okay, wait, why wouldn't they? Why, why wouldn't they? Why do I believe I live in a world where evil has been conquered uh, so that people aren't tempted, people in power aren't tempted. So we've all been waking up slowly, you know, in fits and starts to what, what is going on. And then the question, and th this is the big question, will enough of us wake up in time? We talk about a sleeping giant. I always talk about, you know, Gulliver being tied down by the Lilliputians. He's a sleeping giant. And as long as he's sleeping, they can tie him down. If he wakes up before they get him tied down all the way, they're dead. But if they can just keep him sleeping, and that's basically what is happening with the church. Will the church wake up in time? Will enough of us wake up in time? And I find it just so fascinating. There's so much craziness out there. First of all, that we have somebody named Joe Biden who uh, pretends to be president, but almost everyone in America knows he's not actually running the country. That's fundamentally unconstitutional right there. And I don't believe the Democrats are going to let him run for a second term. In other words, I think that, that uh, we, uh, we, we've had somebody plausibly make the case that Michelle Obama will step in, but I don't believe he's going to do that. Nonetheless, uh, here you have somebody like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. stepping in. He, as you said, has been really courageous on vaccines, re just been absolutely uh, heroic 
in talking about things that other people don't want to talk about. He wrote a book called The Real Anthony Fauci. You want to talk about pulling the curtain <laughs> back. Uh, there's a film coming out. So we're seeing a sifting uh, that we've never seen in our lifetimes to That's see true. parties uh, th that a lot of people who would have considered themselves Democrats w would vote across the aisle. Uh, a lot of people uh, would vote for RFK Jr. before they would vote for uh, Joe Biden. It's a, it's a kind of a mashup that we, I, I, we've never seen in our lifetimes. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very accurate description. But that sounds like when God's moving to me. And I take great hope for that. You know, when I read the book of Acts, nobody was more shocked by what happened at Cornelius's house in Caesarea than the people who were Jesus' best friends. I mean, it freaked Peter out. Peter out. It blew his mind. If he hadn't had a vision multiple times, if there hadn't been an angelic intervention. And, and so they're trying to process what God is doing. And when he goes back to Jerusalem, there's more verses spent explaining it in Jerusalem than describe the original event. We're watching things happen we've never seen before. We're watching the collapse of public trust. We don't trust the CDC any longer. I did until a few years ago. We don't trust the FBI any longer. They lie to spy on sitting presidents. We understand we can't trust the CIA. They process documents that say uh, 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 you know, something is Russian misinformation when they know it isn't. I mean, the list goes on. We don't trust our churches any longer. Well, the collapse of public trust has exposed our idolatry. We've trusted everybody but God. So for the people listening that see all those things happening, this isn't a disaster to me. This is God moving in the earth, preparing a church, preparing his people, awakening us. If America is going to have an extended future of freedom and liberty, it will be because the people of faith decide that faith is more important than the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or our favorite benefit that comes to us from the government. And it, so our foundations have been shaken, but it gives us a different future. Don't be filled with despair. Be filled with trust and hope in Almighty God. Well, despair is a sin. And when I hear particularly Christians, uh, you know, say, well, there's nothing we can do. I think like, wow, thanks for being the voice of the devil, because that's exactly what he wants you to do, to despair and to say there's nothing I can do. God calls us to fight, to do the right thing. Whether we win or lose, God, that's what God calls us to do. And he decides when it's game over. And uh, I think that's part of the challenge is that there's that there's a strain in um, uh, in, in American uh, Christendom that it's that that the the the, the nattering nabobs of negativism to quote uh, Spiro Agnew and William <laughs> Sapphire they just they almost feel like yeah the world's gonna it's all gonna burn there's nothing I can do whatever this is not a biblical view this yeah. is the voice of the devil and. But, but I hear it over and over, or a lot of times I'll put something out on social media and people will call, ch chime in, in in this kind of weirdly negative way. Well, G Jesus is the only answer. In other words, if you put forward a solution, they feel they've got to religiously trump you by saying, but Jesus is the only answer. A as if you didn't assume that in what you were saying. But it's kind of like a hyper-religious view. It's a negative view. Uh, you have long been a voice uh, for hope and for action, and I, I just can't help but think that your, your church and your influence is growing uh, because, because of that. At least that's what I see uh, with other pastors that have been like you. Well, I intend to be an advocate for the kingdom of God and a biblical worldview, and if that grows, then that'll create opportunities. I'm good with that. Yeah. If, if that's diminished, I'll be diminished right along with that. Well, there you go. But I, there is hope. I see good people stepping into the public square. You've mentioned several. You know, Tim Scott, Robert Kennedy Jr. is standing up for truth in some remarkable ways. Ben Carson, you know, has been willing to stand in the public square. Mike Huckabee. I mean, there's a long list of those people. Yeah. It, it's not, we're not absent people of courage and faith, and we, we just haven't been willing to support them. But we're changing. Again, I, I, I have a great sense of anticipation. But I don't imagine that it's going to come without conflict. Yeah. And I'm not advocating violence or belligerence or hate, but it's going to take a different kind of determination. We have apologized our way out of the public square long enough. Well, what's interesting, though, is I think uh, I worry that sometimes uh, politicians who are uh, people of faith 
don't they they don't have the fighting spirit of somebody like a Trump. In other words, I I, I look at people that don't seem to understand what's at stake, uh, and that's what you know. I don't know uh, Senator Tim Scott. I don't know if he would be willing to go against the deep state in the way that I believe Trump would, and in a way that I believe. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. would. I mean, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. knows that the deep state murdered his uncle. Uh, he knows it's what he's it. dealing with. And my question is, yeah, he just said it. And so my question is whether some of these other folks have the fire uh, to go up against the, the, you know, the deep state, these really dark forces that have finally been exposed. It's not clear to me either. And I'm a bit amused. I hear Christians say to me they can't support Trump because he calls people names. <laughs> I've heard that dozens of times. Like, have you read the Bible? Yeah. Listen to what Jesus said. He called people names all the time. And I'm not equating yeah. President Trump and Jesus. But, Je I mean, the, the Gospels are filled with Jesus calling people broods of snakes and vipers and whitewashed tombs and all sorts. The disciples would come to him and say, did you know you offended them? Yeah. I mean, as if Jesus wasn't aware of his audience. It makes me smile. And it, it's we can't be polite with evil. We have to call well, it what it is and yeah. deal with it. And that's and that's my concern, and it's why I have been uh, an advocate for Trump because getting that is not a small thing. Understanding that you're dealing with with just tremendous evil and being willing to fight. Uh, we want to fight God's way, but that still means we have to fight.